Hi guys, welcome to CYC. Today I want to talk about love. We're in the middle of summer, so everyone's all loved up on going to festivals and going on holidays. So it's a pretty good time to take a detour off the more serious topics and talk about something a bit more fun like love. Specifically, I'm going to talk about psychology's understanding of the word, but I'm also going to tack a bit onto the end of my own kind of personal integration of this understanding. Now that bit will not be factual, it will just be my opinion, so kind of take what you want from it. Hopefully it does give you an idea or something like that, but don't take it to heart too much. It's just my kind of interpretation or how I've integrated it. So while there are a few theories of love in psychology, most people in psychology will follow Sternberg's triangle of love. And this says that there are three components to love. That is intimacy, passion, and commitment. And a variation between those three lead to the seven different types of love. It just happens to be three and seven. You know, magic numbers, lucky numbers. I swear it's science. <laughs> the first three types of love are just the components on their own. So just intimacy is friendship. There's no passion and there's no commitment because you're allowed other friends. Then just passion on its own would be infatuation. And that's, well, that's not PG friendly, so skipping past. And then just commitment on its own is empty love. And you can kind of intuitively understand that. Number four is romantic love. And this is where most relationships start. This is when you meet someone new, there's loads of passion and you're talking on like really deep levels, trying to get to know each other. So you have intimacy as well, but you just haven't really kind of decided on what commitment is there yet. Number five then is companionship love. And this might be what you think of as older love. It's when you know the person very well, so you're very intimate, you're committed to each other, but perhaps the passion has just kind of died off. This might be what we think of when we think of our grandparents' love, that kind of old fashioned, really nice. Because if we're being honest, even if that wasn't their type of love, and even if they were very passionate, we have a tendency to kind of compartmentalize that out. Number six is fatuous love. And this is that running off to Vegas and eloping. This is commitment and passion, but just not a whole lot of intimacy. This is that kind of whirlwind sort of adventure that just goes up and away and it, like it can work out, but it just kind of depends on luck whether it does or not. And finally, number seven is consummate love. This is having all three, passion, commitment, and intimacy. And that's what we all kind of strive for. And that's it. Breaking down love in this way will ideally clarify your emotions going through a relationship. Relationships will move between different types of love. As I've said, most relationships will start as romantic love, where you have intimacy and passion, and then you will kind of vet each other out and kind of test and see if you're compatible and you will commit to each other. And then over time, you might lose out on passion or maybe you might grow distant and lose out on intimacy. Whatever it is, your relationship will move around. And I hope that with this breakdown, it might just kind of clarify where the deficit is, if you are having issues in your relationship, what exactly is the issue? Or maybe just kind of clarify what you're really happy about, what you appreciate in your partner, that they're very committed or they're very passionate or they're very good listeners, so you feel a real strong intimacy with them. It's really good to know your strong point as well. Whatever it is, this breakdown, I hope, will help that. And if you're not in a relationship yet, I hope that this breakdown will just kind of clarify your expectations for a relationship in acknowledging that most do start off with intimacy and passion, that you can't really guarantee commitment before those two. Well, you can, but it's an arranged marriage. If you wanna go for that, like, I don't mind, but just, <laughs> I hope this will clarify, basically. I hope that it'll help you in some way. And now, as promised, my own personal integration of this theory, but I am 25 and single, so do not take me as an expert. I try to keep it simple, so I basically have one rule for each component. So to try and keep passion in a relationship, I try to insist on being somewhat sexual on a kind of day-to-day -day basis. This basically just means that if you're in the kitchen that your hands are on their bum or on their back or whatever, or if you're walking past them, that there is a kind of physical contact. And this means doing it when you don't necessarily feel like it. So when I'm driving, I try and make it a habit to have my hand in hers or on her leg, even on days when I don't necessarily feel like it. I know that's what days don't you feel like it, but even if it doesn't click, like I try and make that. But I am human and like, of course I fail. And in a relationship, I get lazy because we all do. 
So I just try and kind of catch myself when I see it and try and give myself a kick. And if I don't, I kind of try to ask her to give me a kick, try and ask her, hey, I want to be this person, so help me stay this person. And that leads directly into my second rule, which is the one to maintain intimacy. This rule says to encourage the other person to critique you. I know that sounds a bit off, but I've I just feel if the other person is not saying what's on their mind, saying what's bothering them, and they're just kind of going along, then you might just end up kind of drifting apart. There's too much stuff left unsaid. Now, this is not trying to condone vicious attacks. This is not trying to condone someone just berating you until you're a mess in the corner. This is very much with good faith in mind that you are trusting the other person to try and make you a better person. They are telling you this flaw or this irritation or whatever it is to try and build you as a better person and build your lives together as a better life. I know it's quite idealistic, but if you can manage it, I think it's a good rule. I'll let you know in 10 years if it works out or not. <laughs> and then the last rule, and this is my weakest rule by far, and that is to maintain commitment in a relationship, I joke about it. Now, this is not addressing actual infidelity or abandonment because they'll break up a relationship. So it's not addressing those. Within a relationship, it tends to be fear of infidelity and fear of abandonment that causes that sort of tension. And I've just found that jokes can be a very good way of kind of exploring those insecurities without the walls going straight up, without feeling overexposed, over vulnerable. That maybe you can talk about it a bit more freely than you would in a serious conversation. For some people this works, for others it doesn't. For some this is just too sensitive a topic and this just won't work. And that's fine. You'll have to talk about it seriously, but you will have to talk about it. But I've just found that when it works, talking about it in a more lighthearted kind of fashion can be kind of beneficial or a bit easier or just more effective. Anyway, that's it for today. I usually try not to insert my personal philosophies, so today was a clear detour. Do let me know whether you like that or not. As always, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye, guys.